Welcome to National Arts. I'm Mike Baker. Ann Mira is something of a show business institution. Best known as a comedian with her husband, Jerry Stiller, she's also had success on stage and in radio and television, both in front of and behind the scenes. Her latest endeavor is an off-Broadway play titled After Play, which takes a look at three couples and their struggles with past and present secrets, the uncertainties of growing older, and the mores of society, all while maintaining, though not always successfully, a good front in the presence of others. And there's a line toward the end of the play where you say, I'm just sharing my feelings with people I love. Right, right. That sums up this whole piece, doesn't it? Well, I, I guess in a sense, the, the play is about uh, uh, friendship and people who have gone along a journey together, uh, shared, shared the same generation, and the uh, necessary losses. Am I quoting Judith Viorst's book, I think? Mm -hmm. Uh, that she wrote, uh, and I think it is sharing feelings with people we love and getting angry and, uh, and compassion and forgiveness. You've been quoted as having said that if you want to know about me, just see this play. Yes, well, everything in the play, uh, the, certainly the feelings, the emotional landscape of the play, I uh, connect with, and um, I actually wrote the play for Jerry Stiller, my husband, and uh, he was doing another play at the time. And then he also said, this is your first play being produced. I don't want to screw it up. And we thought, well, you know, whatever. Well, you didn't count on being in this one either. I, I had mean, no you... idea I'd be in it. I had no intention to be in it. <laughs> I felt it was so freeing to write, you know, you scribble some words on, and you get a director like David Saint. And then Jim Humans comes and makes a set. Uh, the sound was really a beautiful sound plan worked out by John Gramana and uh, Don, who did the lights, uh, just from writing a few words. So that was thrilling. I didn't have to act in it. It's been widely publicized that you've had stage fright when it comes to theatrical audiences and that you overcame that, essentially. No, I did. I did have stage fright. I did have, uh, at the time, uh, <sighs> Look how I'm bragging about my affliction. <laughs> you think you have stage fright, you don't know stage fright. This is yeah, stage I've, fright. I've read some of the circumstances, squeezing people's hands. And... I would squeeze till the blood came on, um, I think it was in a play called uh, Eastern Standard by Richard Greenberg. <clears throat> and I worked with an actress named Barbara Garrick. I, I mean, it was terror, terror. When I was asked to be in a play, and David Saint says, come on in. I said, okay, sure. Because I had no actor's ego. I think that was so great, getting rid of the actor's ego. But I had the writer's ego. I would do anything to get the play a life, to get the play on the boards and to give it a life. I had such joy when this play was done at Manhattan Theater Club, which of course gave us the, uh, the first opportunity to have it produced prior to Carol Ostro and Evangeline Morphos and Nancy Richards and uh, Judy Resnick. The four ladies, four broads put four this play. Four exceedingly intelligent women. Put this play on the boards. <laughs> this is getting a little silly. Renee didn't mean to offend your sensitivity, Oh, you're team with an explanation. Thank you, Phil. It's not your fault, it's me. Uh, Are you OK, honey? I don't need you to defend me. I'm OK. okay. I wasn't defending. Worse explaining. Don't explain me, please. No. By me, you're the Rosetta Stone. I'm sorry, everybody. What is that supposed to mean, Rosetta Stone? Don't be sorry. You have nothing to be sorry about. Richard, that's what it means. Richard. You saw a play. You were deeply moved. You had no reason to apologize to anyone. I'm a very direct person. I have never been cryptic. You are all full of shit. I was invited to come and see the show, possibly producing it, becoming a part of that team. And although I didn't know the other producers who invited me, I thought, gee, I'd love to be involved with this. Let's see what happens. After the show, 
I went up to Anne and I congratulated her and the other producers who had invited me greeted me and they said, what do you think? I said, what do you need? I love it. I think it's great. And so that's, that was that fateful day and, and so we brought it from the Manhattan Theatre Club to this lovely theatre, Theatre 4, on West 55th Street because we knew it had to be an intimate piece, not Broadway. It had to be off-Broadway. Yeah. In keeping the house smaller, I would think that the audience actually becomes part of the play. Oh yes, they become, it, it takes place in a restaurant, all on one set, and it's beautifully designed. Oh, it's, it's, and there's a snow machine. Uh, lots of things are happening before your eyes that you don't realize during the course of the play. And they eat a meal, everybody sits down to eat. And there's music and you hear in the background other voices, so the audience does become a part of the activity and a part of the lives that unfold. They're all friends, they've all grown up together, they're professional actors, comedians, and they talk about their lives and we realize as it unfolds, they don't really know each other as well as they thought they knew each other. And you know, it's a surprise. Yeah, the dramatic technique of actually moving the people around in the shadows almost yes. invites us to take a seat at the table in a way. Yes. Many of us do. Many of us pull up a chair. Yes. Well, that's an interesting directorial feat. David Saint, our director, wanted to keep it. It's one set. You've got so many actors. How do you keep it moving? And when there's no intermission, the audience doesn't move either. So you have to get movement. And it's like a dance. It's choreographed, practically. So you're in the movement, you're seeing it happen, and the time goes by very quickly. In this play, you either become the victim of your mind or you become the master of your mind. And that's really what life's all about, isn't it? Yes. Oh, it, it touches the imagination. And I don't know what the secret to a hit play is. I've had winners and I've had lots of losers. I, I, I can only go by my emotional connection to what's happening, to the story that's being told. And also, I mean, let's not kid ourselves. As a producer, it's got to be a business. And I have to focus on who is the target audience? What are they going to see? How are they going to feel? And are they going to put down $40 or $50 or on Broadway, $100 perhaps, a ticket to connect and to be entertained? You have to be entertained. Remember those drunken parties where Terry used to humiliate you in front of all of them? Oh, God, it was hilarious. Don't do this, Sam. Sorry, Terry. It hasn't been easy. It's okay. I understand. Yeah! I'm very uh, affected. Uh, I feel very gratified when people are moved by the play. You couldn't have written this when you were 25 or 35 or no, 45. You have, to, you have to run the gamut and right. do the deal in that's order to write a piece right. like this. That's right. You really do. Right. You have to have experienced everything to, to feel the feelings these people are feeling. Well, if, if everything in the play did not happen to me, to me, it happened to close friends of mine. And it is a play about aging in a way, isn't it? It's coming to terms when you have uh, less amount of time ahead, there's more to look behind. And uh, some, some guy, some, I didn't go to college, I didn't want four more years as Sister Wonderful, so <laughs> I, uh, and I was a lousy student too, she wouldn't have had me in her class, so. Uh, uh, so who, someone said, the unexamined life is not worth living because there's a, there is a trove of pain in there, but there's also a treasure trove of, I think, creativity of to try to assess, try to make sense. And everyone does that their own way. There's no, you know, there's just so many of these self-help books that say what you're supposed to do. Like if you lose someone and they die, there's these books that say, well, on the third week you're supposed to stop crying and, mm -hmm. you know, the stages yeah. of grief, give me a break. Mm -hmm. People should not have, they should, not read those books. Everyone is unique. You have to. You never really wanted to be a comedian. You wanted to be an actress. And yet I know, but I was elitist. I had such a disdain. <laughs> I was a boring acting student. I had Stanislavski under one arm mm -hmm. and Boleslavski under the other. And anybody <laughs> named Ofsky I had. And it was uh, And yet it's your it's your propensity for both yeah. that puts you in good stead when it comes to doing this piece. I mean well, had you not been a comic, had you not been a, a good actress, you couldn't do both. No, I, I, I think there are many uh, 
comedians. I would say a larger amount of comedians that with the right director, even if they have never acted, can become good actors. I don't know as the converse is true. Now, when I say comedians, I, I mean people who go out there and stand alone, which I found shocking when my husband, Jerry, said, oh, we got to do a comedy act. And I said, you mean break the fourth wall? You mean the objective <laughs> is to get laughs? How crass, how crude, <laughs> how scary. And you were very good at it. Yeah, we were, we're OK. Yeah, he, but talks, he talks, Not the in truth Cleveland, in but I got oh, really? even with Cleveland. Well, Cleveland, nobody gets, nobody gets it in oh, Cleveland. Oh, if I had a it. concertina, they would have loved me. <laughs> My mother and father died in a car accident in Florida. Right after we got the phone call telling us that they died. Two pigeons. Flew onto our apartment balcony. They just circled around us and then flew away. <laughs> Merwin, Marty is kind of the sensitive guy of the 90s, isn't he? Yes, he is. Uh, but I think he's also got a quiet strength. I hope he's got a quiet strength, which reads to the audience as well, because a lot of it might look as if he's kind of easygoing uh, and, and maybe even flip, but that's. That's just on the surface. I think mean, underneath there's a nice strength in that relationship because the character that Anne plays, uh, who's my wife, uh, she's the one who's kind of loud and brassy and forward and so on and so forth. And it's balanced by a guy who is taking all of this, uh, you know, indulges all of this with her because he adores her, he loves her. Uh, but he's also very strong when, when it's needed. Here's a man that seems to understand what's going on around him, and yet he's not, he, he's not reticent to say that, I just want to make some sense of it all. Yeah. And therein yeah. lies some of the beauty of the play. And I love, if you'll forgive me, <laughs> just the simplicity of that line and, and saying it simply, I'd just like to make some sense out of it all. And that comes up in our sort of little metaphysical section. Because you have embraced therapy and you have a clear understanding of yourself and the people around you, do you think that your character, in a way, comes out of this a little less unscathed than some of the others? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I think we have already gone through that. Yes. A lot of what the, the, the characters pain are going through and now. So forth. Sure. And I think there's an understanding between my wife and I. And the other couple has not been through therapy. And they're still fighting a lot of things. And so forth. I think there's a good contrast there. Mm -hmm. And it's part of our message is to tell them, please, if you get some kind of help, whether it's from a minister or a rabbi or a therapist or whatever, but say the things that need to be said to people that you love and care about. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very passionate cry in all of that. That last scene was transcendent. Brilliant choice. Loaded. Ending like that back at the beginning when they're all young. And hopeful looking to the future. Not knowing what we know, that their dreams are going to be destroyed. There's the realization that that's what that's life is. Yeah. Life has all sorts of wonderful things in it, but there is an ending to all good things, you know, that we have to be, have a sense of balance about all of this. And uh, that's one of the beauties of the play is that there's so many rather pithy things that are dealt with and in the lightest, funniest, most hilarious way. And it's got something serious to say. It's something that's moving and touching. And it's also very, very funny. Have you ever seen dialogue so real? Uh, no, no. And the funny thing is that when any of us have gone to restaurants with each other or other people, we find we're saying lines <laughs> from the play. <laughs> And people say, oh, yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's, it rings so true. It's no longer visceral. It's actually been contained within, right? <laughs> and the characters have been absorbed, and they're part of you for life. But it's very right. true. I mean, if you think of how people talk, rarely when you have a group of friends together do you finish a sentence. That's there's right. There's always someone jumping in, well, you know, and there's all, I mean, that's, that's reality. Yes, that's one of the things I love about this, because it happens to my character several times where I get on attack about something or other, and then somebody else is dealing with something else, yes. and I've got to jump back into that. And, and it happens in life a great deal. Especially after a drink or two. Yes. A, yes. a dose your, of reality, sure. Your mind is going in a lot of di different directions. <laughs> well, these kids are all alike. They will drag you down to hell with their scorn and their resentments. The diseases and the drugs. No, don't, don't upset yourself. That boy was suffering. His parents didn't hear him. His parents didn't want to hear him. Don't start 
judges. Don't lecture them. Well, nor did you judge and jury. I'm not lecturing. Why do you judge? They sabotage us. They wreck us. Larry. Phil Shredman, I mean, think, think the name says it all, right? Yeah. I mean, you have a rather yeah. cynical approach to oh, life. Oh, God, yeah. Well, but if he, was, if he didn't have his comedy, it'd be ho it, you know, life would be hopeless for him. That's his armor, that's his defense, that's his uh, social acceptance. That's, uh, that's what he uses to, to deal with his pain. He's a very honest man as well. I think so. I think he really can't understand why things have gone so wrong. He's a... As the play says, he's a gag writer, he feels, who got lucky, and he's made, done well in Hollywood and so on. He pulled himself up, nobody helped him. Mm -hmm. uh, in his life, he had to take care of a sick sister for 25 years. His father ran off when he was young. And he's made a life for himself, so he can't understand why his kid doesn't do the same, what they're all complaining about, they're whining. And uh, it's, it's a loss to him because he feels in his, in his uh, uh, frame of reference, he's done everything he can do that he knows to do for his son, whom he has no connection with, and it's one of the, big, the biggest pain of his life. He's willing to admit he's not uh, omnipotent, obviously. There are things that he does not understand. Right. That's why he drinks a lot, too. Yeah. It's almost as if, uh, from the initial outset, that there are two different sides of this table. There is the more sensitive approach to life, and there's the more cynical approach to life. Then things begin to mix up somewhat as, right. the, as the, uh, the musical chairs begins to take place, and many of the issues and many of the concerns become somewhat... Uh, I guess, married in a way. Well, it, what Anne has written is quite remarkable. She, first of all, she's spent her whole life listening, obviously, and remembering what she's heard, and it's, a lot of it is in this play, and it's written with such a, a, a sense of truth and reality, and there are so many levels that resonate with the characters uh, that uh, it gets to be like a string quartet with overlapping uh, conversations. Uh, it is the way people talk. It is the way they think. It is the way they uh, they relate to each other. Uh, yeah, it starts out a lot more clear cut, and in a sense, you know, at the end of the play, the table is a mess. The chairs are all askew, and that is that is really representative of of what's happened. How interesting that the catharsis that you go through in this play, if you are willing to accept that kind of sensitivity, that kind of emotion as a parent. Maybe the kids wouldn't have turned out the same way if we could have been a little more open like we were at this table. Well, I think, yeah, and I think any parent today who's, uh, who's 50s, in their 50s or 60s will understand what all of this, it's generational. I think that certain generations have certain kinds of problems with their kids. I had with my parents, uh, and I know that my daughter had with me. So I, I don't know that it ever goes away, and we can always say if we could, if we could be more sensitive and open with our kids. So people who are sensitive and open with their kids wind up with different kinds of problems with their kids. I, uh, some are successful. I know families where they're, you know, they're, they're kind of... You know what I take away from Anne's play? So many things, obviously, but one thing in particular that your generation, and to a certain extent my generation, we had this youthful innocent, and then we were ambushed with all this reality. The young people today, they're not ambushed. They have the reality right up front from the initial stages. So therein lies the big dichotomy of these two worlds. Yeah, it is different. I, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, young people find it sometimes hard to listen to the way we talk about them. Mm -hmm. You know, I had one, uh, one young person I know see the play, and I said, well, what'd you think? She said, well, I, God, I mean, I hated the way you, you, you talked about kids. I mean, that was, I, I almost couldn't listen to it. I said, well, that's probably because you spent a lot of your life trying to be understood and not enough of it trying to understand, mm -hmm. right? And then she hit me with the colander. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, many of us have uh, a tendency to focus on our own foibles and problems and troubles in the world, and that preponderance will always get you in trouble, won't it? And yeah. it does your character. Yeah, except that what Anne has done is written it not only f with a dark side, but with a comic side as well. So you see it through the, through the prism of, of, of laughter and, and, and its comic and bizarre uh, nature. And the laughs we get are, are deep, big laughs of recognition, where people actually you know, understand the characters and understand the situations and the behavior. That's, they're laughing at it because they're there, they're identifying. Yeah. How ironic that the pain that you incur as a parent is the very thing that seems to bring you around or make you more of a human being. So it's that pain and angst that, in a way, matures you as a true adult. Sure, it does. The, the thing that's so wonderful about this is kind of like a stock taking of the evening as it goes on. And um, it is the arrival of the other couple 
And that scene, which I believe empowers the rest of the play, the characters in the rest of the play, to confront what it is they, up until that time, have been bantering about. They've been talking about the play they saw. They've been talking about how either they were moved or not moved. One couple sees it as deeply touching, deeply involving. The other couple sees it as technique and craftsmanship, and they're unmoved, and they're, re they're removed from, from the feeling and emotion of it. All that changes as the play goes on, and part of the reason for the change is that scene in the middle, which I think is so uh, shattering and so uh, affecting. You all killed my boy! You hear me? Stop it! I'm sorry. Me. My wife. We lost our son. Yes. You know, there is a whole semblance of our society that even in the face of this crisis, even in the face of this loss and this heartbreak, still take this hard line approach to this disease and this problem that we have. Oh, well, the AIDS. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, that's in our society. I think dealing with it's that's very important. It's affected everyone I know. Yeah. It's affected everyone I know. People my age people younger, people older, people, uh, uh, every, every young person I know gets tested. I mean, it's like a part of their life. And we never had this. No. We just had guilt. And now there's death. So I think it, it should be the major, major issue in our, our health well, don't get me started about the health care in this country because the, just the insurance companies get fatter and fatter. And I remember having seen you a number of times on the Ed Sullivan Show, and then I was looking through the notes to see 36 times on the Ed Sullivan we Show. We never that's, argued with him. He was like, you know, Pat O'Brien in those movies yeah. where doughboys are dying right. on the, just make the world safe for democracy. Mm -hmm. Jerry always looked at him, he says, he reminds me of Pat O'Brien, <laughs> and Pat O'Brien breaks my heart because he, he said Kaddish over the dying Jewish soldier in some movie, I don't know. <laughs> I said, God, you're a, you're a pussycat. You're a pushover for that stuff. He scared us. He was a benevolent despot, and, but he liked us because his, his wife, Sylvia, was Jewish and he was Irish Catholic, and I think that resonated with him. But when he could have said we were on two times or 132 times, we'd just smile, because when he called you over, that was terrific. You put together a video, a rather commonsensical video, about So You Want to Be an Actor. We did. Dawn Eaton, who is our associate and friend, she produced it. And uh, she put the, the, there's a booklet. What it is, is we're just the hosts. But it's like a road map for anyone coming to New York City to study acting. Because we interviewed, we interviewed Uta Hagen. We interviewed Rosemary Tischler, who was assistant artistic director at the Public Theater. Johnny Planko, an agent at William Morris, casting people, Pat McCorkle, Joan C. down at the three of us studios, photographers. We interviewed actors as uh, bartenders and waiters, you know, discussing survival jobs and stuff. So it, it's like a, it, it doesn't, it's not called So You Want to Be a Star, it's called So You Want to Be an Actor, just what's out there. And you found your way into soap operas and have been very successful with a recurring role. Isn't that amazing? Yes. I play this old Irish woman Peggy Moody yeah. on All name. My Children. Great name. Yes. They're lovely, though. All people at All My Children over there at ABC. Do we understand each other? I'm beyond understanding what makes you tick. And as for having me fired, pigs will sprout wings first. Besides, I'll be at Wild Wind, out of harm's way. I am over and done with cleaning up after you, miss. Are you going to write some more? Oh, yeah, that's what play? I want to do. I don't know if anyone will come, but I'm going to oh, write them. This one will play forever. Well, I think there's good parts. I think uh, I'm certainly not the first actor to, to, to be a playwright. I think actors have good ears to listen. I have a lot to learn yet, and I still, uh, but I have things I want to say. Hope they're not too weird. 
the ones you're working on now. Can you share any of the topics with oh, us? Oh, it's just about choices made in life. Choices. And many choices. For roads not taken, other, the other roads there. Your husband. Yes. Did you fall in love with him because he made you laugh? No, not at all. Not What'd at all. I, I couldn't stay. I don't know. I fall, <laughs> fell in love with him about seven years ago, actually, <laughs> out of 42. We were very slow starters. Yeah. We were married 42 <laughs> years. Then we waited 10 years to have kids and uh, started therapy when I was like 58. So we're, we're just getting, uh, no, I, of course I loved him. I, but, you know, we were joined in so many ways. I learned to respect comedy through Jerry Stiller. I really did. And I learned to, to just to, to do it and to know I could do it and to know I can really do this. And it's scary, but I never stood alone like so many talented women do today. I was always with Jerry, the two of us. So it was kind of like us against them. And we got, in a way, we weren't waiting for the phone to ring anymore because we had our act, but it wasn't easy. You know, family and act. Well, see my play. <laughs> Too busy trying to get rich and famous. Thank you for joining us on National Arts. We hope you enjoyed this moving and satirical examination of life as seen through the eyes of Ann Mira and her colleagues. Until next time, remember, art was meant to be appreciated, so you be a part of it.